I invite us to attend now to the reading and receiving of our scripture lesson this morning, taken from Psalm 145, verses 17 through 21. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, your servants wait upon you, and we pray that the words we speak, the meditations of our hearts, would be acceptable to you, pleasing to you, and according to your purpose. For you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As you may imagine, pastors have lots of opportunities to listen to folks share their, their lives, their problems, their challenges, their joys, their sorrows, their dreams. If we listen well, we can tell a lot in these conversations about a person's faith perspective. We can listen for those experiences, those circumstances, those relationships, those ideas that have shaped someone's spirituality. We can often hear how a person's faith is shaped by how they see and understand God. Our faith understanding, our God understanding, is, is something of a dialogue. It's a tightly woven conversation that we all have all the time, and hopefully throughout our entire lives. Hopefully we're growing in those perspectives. We are deepening our faith and deepening and expanding and developing, maturing in our understanding of who God is. I recall one fellow some years ago in another church I was serving. He was the friend of a church member and had been advised to give me a call and set up an appointment. He wanted to meet to talk about his grief, his grief over his recently deceased wife. Well, when we met and we began the conversation, I quickly learned that recently for him was seven months prior. His wife had been gone seven months, and he was still struggling to understand why he could not turn off the tears. He began crying almost as soon as we started our conversation, and he cried throughout our conversation. I asked him about his wife and their marriage and their family, what kind of person she was, what things that she valued, and what he valued the most in her. Then we talked about what it meant to lose somebody close, having now living life on a daily basis without the love of a partner that he had had for so long. At first, his words came slowly and, and, and tearfully. But when he found his, his voice and began to talk about his wife and paid a beautiful tribute to her, still among the tears, and as he finished, I asked him to consider something. What do you think your wife, who you clearly loved, and she loved you, what do you think she would want for you and your life now. 
didn't take him long to agree that his wife would want for him the best happiness to live his life fully to engage in all the joy of life as well as the heartache maybe especially now that she was gone so I asked him if he thought God wanted the same thing for him and he said I don't know I, I just don't understand why God would take her away from me turns out her death to cancer and with cancer had been a hard one and particularly the last days were difficult this man had associated God with death but not with life this man had associated God with death but not with life as we worked our way through these thoughts he came to remember that life is a gift and that God desires the best for his children desired the best for his wife desired the best for him he acknowledged that his wife's life was a gift it was now over but it had been a gift and his life was a gift from God death and pain and heartache and sorrow may be a part of that life in fact I would say inevitably they will be a part of every life and God is to be found however in the midst of such things not somehow separate or counter to such things the psalmist knew this deep truth about life and did not hesitate to bring his anguish to the throne of the Almighty Psalm 13 reads in part how long O Lord will you forget me forever how long will you hide your face from me how long must I bear the pain of my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? I dare say if we're honest in our heart of hearts, every single one of us has had those thoughts and felt those feelings. But you know how Psalm 13 ends? The psalmist says, but I trust in your steadfast love and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation our God is big enough to handle anything we may think or say any doubt any worry any fear any anxiety anything we may choose to lay before God God can take it I can recall as a young man that realization dawning upon me at a moment in my life when I was sort of feeling sorry for myself and kind of wallowing in some self-pity the realization that God is bigger than those things bigger than me for sure but in God's largesse in God's greatness God desires the very best for us, for all his children, for all of creation. And that is such an amazing thing. God can handle it. I realize this is deep stuff as we journey through the darker times in our lives, the challenges, the heartaches, the heartbreaks. But this is so important. How we understand God makes a big difference in how we meet and embrace life and death. Elie Weissel, the author and poet who survived the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, tells of an incident that spoke volumes about our understanding of God. A teenage boy in the concentration camp had been caught plotting against the Germans. The camp commandant brutally hung the young boy and two other men on gallows in front of the entire camp to set an example, forcing everyone to watch as they died. 
Faced with this horrific scene, Eli Weissel heard a voice somewhere behind him in the crowd of prisoners. Where is your God now? Weissel felt another voice welling up inside of his spirit. And that voice said, He is hanging there on those gallows with that boy. Eli Weissel was a Jew, and the horror and death of the concentration camp nearly obliterated his life. But something survived and carried him through. In a speech accepting the Nobel Prize in 1986, Weissel said as he recounted the injustice and cruelty that is still prevalent, prevalent in the world. It, is, it was then, it is today. He said this, But I have faith. Faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even in God's creation. Without it, no action would be possible. And action is the only remedy to indifference. The most insidious danger of all, he said, there is so much to be done. One person, a Raoul Wallenberg, an Albert Schweitzer, a Martin Luther King Jr., one person of integrity can make a difference, a difference of life and death. As long as one dissident is in prison, our freedom will not be true. As long as one child is hungry, our life will be filled with anguish and shame. What all these victims need to know above all is that they are not alone, that we are not forgetting them, that when their values are stifled, we shall lend them ours, that while their freedom depends on ours, the quality of our freedom depends on theirs. This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer meant in part when he spoke of the cost of discipleships, the title of his most famous book. How the grace of God is free to us, but it costs God everything. That's the kind of God we serve. A God who is willing to pay the fullest price for us to keep us, to find us, to call us back, to redeem us. When I visit with those who are at the end of their life due to age or illness, I remind them, and I remind them of this amazing love of this God we serve. My deepest privilege and honor, humbly, is to see how God brings peace and grace upon the souls of his faithful and upon their families. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely, the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the psalmist is right to proclaim that the Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. And in the face of our worst inhumanity, God stands with us and will not let us go, will not abandon us. God weeps with us. God even dies with us. To show how great and transformative his love is. To say that even death is not the last word. We serve a risen Lord who has broken the power of death, of shame, of guilt, of sin, of all the darkness that the world can throw at us. There is no length to which God will not go to love us and claim us. 
The psalmist captures this too. Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Or where am I to flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. For most of us, most of the time, we can find God to the immediate and personal concerns of our lives, like when we pray to God to help us pass a test for which we have not studied. Hmm. Or like the man who climbed on his roof as the floodwaters rose, he declined help from the rescue helicopter and from one boat and then a second boat who came by to see if he needed help or needed saving. And he kept saying, God will save me, God will save me. And when the waters finally swept him away and he found himself before the Almighty, the man pleaded, Lord, why did you not save me from the floodwaters? And you know the answer. God says, I sent you help three times. We sell God short when our understanding is too narrow and too shallow. Our God is so broad and so deep beyond even what our human minds can fathom. That's why we make a mistake when we try to use Scripture or we try to use our theology, our faith understanding to, to define God neatly in a box with a pretty bow on and wrapping around it or him God in, or try to tell God where God's limits are, or try to predict what God is going to do or never does or must do. We get a lot of guidance from the Scriptures, but the life of faith is not meant to be a black and white certain thing all the time. God is too big for that. God is too great for that. God's mercy and grace are broader and more wondrous than that. What kind of God do we serve? One evening they brought Jesus a woman who'd been caught in adultery, caught in breaking the Torah. They even challenged Jesus as they held the rocks in their hands and the bloodlust was in their eyes. They said, Rabbi, the law is clear here. It, sta it states quite clearly and commands us to stone to death this woman caught in sin. What do you say? And Jesus gave his famous answer combining both justice and mercy. Let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. One by one the accusers dropped their rocks and faded away into the night. After they dispersed, Jesus turned to the woman and said, Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Well, neither do I. Go your way and sin no more. Jesus did not ignore or excuse the woman's actions. He also did not ignore the law. But Jesus read the law in the context, in the context of mercy, of loving kindness. Led by the author of the law, Jesus saw in this woman, saw her as more than a sinner. He saw her as a precious child of God. A rabbi gathered with his students in a seminary and was teaching them about how to become good rabbis. And he was instructing his students in how to tell the beginning of the Sabbath. That's very important. If you're the leader of a synagogue or of a Jewish community, you've got to always make sure you're starting and ending the Sabbath on time and calling the people to prayer and to worship. 
So he asked his students how they could tell that. One student said, oh, it's, it's when the sun finally recedes down beyond the western horizon. Another student said, no, no, it's when the very first stars appear in the night sky. That's the beginning of the Sabbath. To all of their answers, the rabbi shook his head and he said, no, the Sabbath begins when we have enough light in our souls to recognize the face of God in everyone we meet. That is the kind of God we serve. Amen.